there's some other topics in the world of finance business that I actually think we can get into so much interesting stuff here because all these conversations come up on all the podcasts, mate. When they talk about player signings, they don't just stay in their lane and talk about if the player's good or bad for this team or if he's good or bad generally. They try to wade in people who have zero business experience, and I don't claim to have any. I just actually go out there and try and find things out before I talk out my ass. They talk about things like, man, there's just number two heights. How do you know? How the fuck do you know what the offers are? You don't know anything about this industry. You're just a guy who knows if they're good in the game. So things to me like... Is a buyout too much? How much should a buyout be? Should a team should a team sell a player if they can get a lot for him? When should they keep him? Agents, what are their role? I feel like there's so much we can do here. So let's just start with the whole buyout topic, right? Because people might have seen on my channel, I'll link it above. I did a video and it was about crazy buyouts. That was actually the title of it. And it was actually inspired by the information, because I was able to give an exact example, that Rops from Mouse Sports, who everyone knows is a fucking monster player right now, and was really good even when Mouse Sports was kind of shit with the old lineup. He's one, obviously, he's someone where when his contract ends, apparently at this point in time, I think it'd be like nine, eight, nine months, he would obviously be one of the most eligible players to join, by the way, the best teams in the world, because they're the ones actually now trying to get him. We're talking about teams where they're, the, basically, here's the spoiler to fans. Without saying who the teams are, the teams that are trying to get him think it's worth a buy at paying a lot because he's the last piece. They think if they add him, that's it. We're, you know, we're there. We can win the major. We can be the number one team. We can be the dominant team. It's not like they're just building a team. He could go and join a much better team than the Mouse Sports lineup. The problem is Mouse Sports knows that. And if you know the history of Mouse Sports in CSGO, like in 1.6, yeah, they won the best because they had the German talent. They had all that money. But in CSGO, they've always been a team that for me... They're, they're the real team that money balls, Lerpus. And all the dumbass fans use that for every other team. They're the team that gets people usually pretty cheap and gets them on salaries that aren't the top 10 salaries, top five salaries in the world. But they become a top 10, top five team. So they get way more value out of it. And then they always sell people for a good price. They get a nice, they get a Nico buyout. They get a Carrigan, but you know, they, get, they get whatever deals they need, basically. And they seem to always actually be able to survive. And I have to say, if you if you were to look track ranking against what I imagine they've paid, they're probably doing pretty well out of a lot of teams. So when you hear a story like this, if they were going to let Rob score, first of all, even though there's all these people bidding, they're only going to let him go for a massive number. It's a million and a half, let's say, is a rough figure here. So we'd be talking, by the way, about potentially the biggest buyout of all time in CSGO for a banging player, certainly. Now, if you're a fan, the problem I see on this one is if you want Rops to be on a better team, you're just going to say, sell him, he wants to go, which is irrelevant. If you're someone who's a fan of Mouse, you're going to go, don't sell him, he's the best player. I want to know, like, what would the factors be if you're in this scenario? Like, when should you sell a player like that who is your best player, but you could get an enormous price? When should you hold out if there's a lot of people? What, do you, what are your thoughts on this particular case? Well, I mean, we'll start just by talking about, like, the things that go into the yeah, value of buyout maybe a little bit, because I think once you go into, like, when you would sell or why not, I think it gets more complicated. So just tackle one by one. Um, so first of all, I think that, the one thing that's actually most often very misunderstood is the the impact that contract length has on buyouts because it's all about leverage. If it, let's just say hypothetically, there's a team that wants to buy just any very good player, doesn't have to be Rops, and the roster lock is coming up for the for the major in two weeks. It's completely relevant if the guy's contract expires in three weeks. Makes no difference. They need him in two weeks, which means yes. they're going to have to pay. And the other, per, the person on the other side at the table, if they're smart, they know that they're going to use that against them in the negotiation. So there's been, I think, many scenarios where people have kind of publicly talked about, oh, you know, like only has six months left on the contract. Well, it doesn't matter if you need them now. Yes. Um, and the, the other piece, by the way, is, you know, if you're the player, a lot of the time the players feel the pressure to get whatever roster trans, you know, whatever transfer they want done now because they know as well as anybody that whatever roster they want to join is one bullshit result the way from not wanting to make a roster change at all. As you and I know, that's how, that's how the whole industry works. Um, So say, say Rob's, you said, you know, in the neighborhood of one and a half million, I mean, one, he's very young player. He's like 19. Is he 20? Something maybe 21, but he's finally inexperienced and young. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, he's, he's very, he's very experienced actually, but he's still very young. So like you could, like, there's a, there's a case to be made that he's he could be your like number one star, number two guy sure. for like five years, first of yes. all. So like, you know, it's not like somebody that you're paying a big price that you're amortizing over two years. This could actually 
be over five years, could be over a longer period. And if you think the game is going to continue growing, which, by the way, is like the only reason to invest in the games when they're not profitable today, that number might look a lot smaller five years from now than it does today. Um, the the other thing is he's you know he's marketable, like he's well spoken, he speaks good English, uh, is perfectly like normal, good looking guy. Sure. Like you can you can put him on you know in your yes. commercials. Uh, no one's gonna have a problem with that. So like from that perspective, he's valuable to use in just like marketing sponsorship perspective, which still runs the whole industry. It's worth keeping in mind. Um, and then the third thing is like. He's, as far as I can tell, he's just a very likable guy. I think, if, like, I've never heard anybody say they wouldn't want to play with him. He's like a, he's first of all a very good player. I think he's been, you know, somewhere in the top twenty, top ten for the last couple of years globally, uh, and like he easily fits into like almost any team, any team. I think the way he plays, so like he sure. potentially has a lot of places to go. Likable, like doesn't have like a, I don't think like a strong, challenging personality based on what I've heard. So like easy to get along with. Um, like that just makes him that just makes him somebody that's going to garner a lot of interest from a lot of different places and if you have him under contract you know I don't know how long it's for but like if it's more than a year you're going to It's less have than to that pay. it's supposed to be about uh, this part like I say eight or nine months left I think no, I mean look in any case like if if you're mouse let's just say let's say you get offered 500 today what do you have left you sell rops what do you have left you're effectively just taking whatever the payment is has to be enough to either rebuild your roster or just completely accept that you're just not going to be very relevant in the in the immediate future because i i don't think mouse would be if they okay. let go of props i think you know he's the he's the guy um and there might also be key man clauses to some of their sponsorships so right. you know a lot of the a lot of the time when on teams like that, like I think Rob's clearly has been the most marketable, most valuable player from sponsorship sure. perspective on mouse sports, similar to how you would think like Fallen on MIBR, for example. Uh, simple on Navi, it's almost certain that many of the sponsorship deals that the, that those teams have have key man clauses tied to the players because really they want to sponsor that player and they want the extra media value from the broadcast tournaments, etc. But they really care about that one player. And if you let go of that one player, you know, sponsoring Navi becomes very different if Simple's not there. Yes. Um, sponsoring Mouse Sports becomes very different if Rops is not there. So then you're actually, what you're trading on is, one, he might only have eight or nine months left. He might even be saying today that he probably won't resign. He, he probably will want to go somewhere else. Well, like, how is Mouse doing? I, you know, I think they're probably... I would guess ahead where most people thought they were going to yes, be after the sure. latest roster changes. So yes. like you might be, you might be banking on just showing a little bit more progress over the next, you know, like three to four months. Again, like we said at the top of the call, you know, it's a couple of good results away from saying, Hey, why don't we extend for a little bit more? We'll overpay you. So, you know, like you feel like you're compensated. Maybe you think the fair, you know, the fair number is X will pay you 50% more for this like six month period to give this project more time. And then like, if you still want to go, like, you know, we'll find a way to get you to another team. Like that, th there's all these other considerations. And I think especially in Mouse's case, like what do you, how important do you think Counter-Strike is to Mouse relative to the other properties that they're in in esports? I mean, it seems like the biggest game to them. It seems like, you know, what their whole... Fa like, to me, if your team's like Mouse Sports, Fnatic, like, is it, yeah, you, you might have other games as well, but CS is an, an integral part of your identity, you know? So then, what, what do you think happens to your company if you effectively, not shut down, but, like, take a really big step back for your biggest game? My guess is you're not renewing your current sponsorships sure. at a premium the next time around. And what's absolute death for, you know, VC backed or, you know, not necessarily VC, but like similarly growth investor, family office type back companies is that you stop growing. And that's that's what you can't really afford or what at least will make your life a lot harder. So there's there's a lot more, I think. I think a lot more relies on some of these just couple of players on these big teams that I think people give credit for. And I think there's a lot more leverage in play and a lot more factors than whatever is happening right there. And then, and I think the community at large generally tends, tends to focus on what does it say for the last three months? How did they do in the last two tournaments? And like, what is the probability that they do a lot better? 
And I think that's just short-sighted and just misses the big picture in a lot of ways. Right, when we come to the idea of basically who is the one who's not making the right move here? And basically it goes like this. Let's say we're in a scenario like I just described. A player that like, in theory, if you could get the money, you want to sell because you can just get so much money. As you say, you could retool your whole roster. You could maybe even replace him with a player who's like 80% as good, who's an up-and-comer, you know, and then you get another player. You know, Maybe it can be what actually makes your team better. And then you've got the factor that the teams that want to sign him, he's the last piece, so they want him because it could be, you know, it can turn a team that's like seventh and all right now into the number one team or the contender and you know for the major you could be ready right here's what i want to know say you are on something like that there's like eight nine months left right both sides can play the leverage game there right because you know what you said earlier but it's only it's only like they'll say publicly the teams that want the guy to sign or the players that want him to sign will go he's only got six months left then why are you saying that and not waiting six months to get him for free exactly cocksucker because you want him now so actually you've made it the other way around you've tried to project publicly that they're the one under the gun but you're the one under the gun so here's the here's my question i want to see where you come down on it i can see it both sides like essentially it is a game of chicken if you're the people from the team that want to sign Rops, technically if you can wait out the whole contract and no one buys him, you can get him for free and spend all that money on his salary, buy another player. Yeah, there's a world where it eventually flips and you become the power player. In fact, by the way, when there's about two or three months left on that contract, assuming someone else doesn't panic buy him, now most sports become the people with the sword of Damocles because if they want some money, they've got to sell him. If they wait three months, they get nothing. Now the other side of it, obviously, is if you're actually the guy's who, um, let me think how I'd phrase this. Oh, I think I basically said it there. If your mouse spots, it can affect you. But also if you're the team that needs to buy now, that also might be the case. Maybe you don't want to wait that many months because then someone else can come up with the number. They can fight. They can have the bad result. That means they need to buy him and they spend the 200k extra. Like, how do you weigh it up in that regard? Like, how, because this is the tricky part. Fans will just think, I want him to join or the worst one ever is he says he wants to join. Like, obviously those factors should almost never factor into the deal part of it, you know? So where do you come down? Down on like how you'd play the game of waiting out or selling at the highest like the, the little bit of chicken there that goes on it's like playing poker you're not playing the hand you're playing the other person i think so one what you've done previously will have an impact on what you can do going forward and therefore what you're doing now will also have an impact on your dealings going forward so i mean for example i think i think i have a reputation that like i like, I'm pretty direct. I say what I think. And then, like, I'm not necessarily going to change my opinion from there. And I think... Not that much wiggle room, right? Yeah. Um, so I think people... I think people respect that sooner than they might with somebody else. I mean, there's been... There has been situations where we've... Like, somebody... We've sold some of the big-name players. And, you know, the the management of another team will have called me and said like, hey, here's a really big number, one of the biggest numbers of all time. And we know the guy won't play. He wants to move. Like, can we make a deal? And I said, no, the number is this. And like, when you get to this number, we can talk. And before then, like, we should not talk because we're not going to change our view. And then be like, click. And if you, and you know, you wait a couple of weeks and you start thinking, and then like, then there's a the question, like, can you continue waiting? Um, are you going to be the one who goes back and say like, hey, about that offer? In which case, no, the ball's in their court. They have the leverage. Or are you actually okay just sitting back? And will you actually just trust the process like that you get the result that you should have? And, you know, you're not going to always win. I think there's been, I think in big grand scheme of things, so like in terms of bigger, bigger buyouts, I think it's worked out really well for us historically. But there's been a couple of like, you know, smaller name players that we've had on the roster where like that hasn't worked out. Um, and you don't always win. But like, I think, I think a lot of it just comes down to your negotiation style. And then like the reputation that you have, and also just understanding where the other team is and what they're thinking, you know, for example, there might be a situation where you just know that there's somebody else on that team who's pushing for a roster change. And it could be that their rust their contract is up and they're not willing to sign a deal unless, you know, some change happens. And therefore you know that actually you have all the leverage because right. you're getting help from the inside just yes. almost by accident. Um, so, you know, there's like countless different factors like that that go into it. Ultimately, you know, you you play the other person and you play to some extent your hand, but you know, in many of these situations, eventually you will get to a point where, where the player will just say publicly, like, I went out, I won't ever play for this team again, like, just make a deal. 
And we've been pretty open with some of the players who have wanted to bench, bench themselves, for example, and said, like, they don't want to play with this team anymore. I've been very open with them and said, like, listen, like, you know, you have the right to do that. And, like, if you want to do that, that's fine. But, like, I don't want to hear you coming to me in two months complaining about this. So I'm just telling you now, there's a chance that you sit on the bench for the next 18 months. And, like, if that happens, then, like, it sucks for your career, but we're willing to do that. So, like, don't act surprised in four months if nothing's happened. And like, Actually, this is a topic I want to get in on. What, here's the that's thing. what we've said from the beginning. And, like, some yeah. people have gotten frustrated as time has gone by. And I'm sure you've heard of some of those. But that's kind of how, how you have to play it. Let me expand on exactly that topic, because that was actually where I wanted to go next, which goes, that's all the fans focus on. Because remember, let's face it, they are fans of the players, they're fans of big players, and they want to see great Counter-Strike, and they want to see players go to players. By the way, I get it, before I knew about business at all, I used to be the same pleb in the NBA. Of course, I want every small market team to give up their star to go and make a fucking super team with the player I like, so they win the show. Of course, we all understand that, right? But it doesn't interact with business. Now, the problem is, as you've just alluded to, the area it does in esports, and the reason why I have so little respect for a lot of the GMs in this business is they actually all tend to fall for what you've just described in most cases I've heard, which basically goes like this. If the player internally says, not only do I want to leave, but I don't even want to stay, so I won't play properly. Essentially, they say like, I'll fuck your team up and sabotage you, but not in as many words. You know, what do you say? The James Harden. Yeah, basically, they, but they'll say it. And then obviously the, the really egregious ones are the ones where they will publicly state also, like, I don't want to play for this team and I want to leave. Now, when they do that, right, to a fan and even some people in the industry, and this really disappoints me, they just go, well, if he's not going to play properly, what would the point in keeping him be? You have to just sell him then. As though, by the way, that's just instantly created leverage where a player who's eligible wants to leave, the other team wants him, all the balls should be in your court. You're now supposed to just give him away for free or very cheap because he wants to leave in that scenario. Now, I will say in this situation, the reason why I blame the GMs, not even the players, because at the end of the day, the players exist at the leisure of the team orgs that they've signed for. They don't have the power to actually do these things. As you say, very few people actually will discipline that player. A lot of people even will just bend over backwards and try and get him out of there. Like I've heard stories where it's like, this is like this is like your best player and you're winning tournaments. And he's like, yeah, but he wanted to leave. So what was the point in keeping him if he's not motivated? I had to sell him to the other team. It's like one of your rival teams. So I even think in that regard, GMs should actually stop being pussies and they should put their foot down because if I'm paying a guy $30,000 a month and I have a competent team, I not be as good as the one he wants to play for. You can be a professional for six months and just play out the game. Like you might not like it, but you can play it out. And by the way, if you don't, this is why people need to put their foot down. As Lopez says, if I bench you, Enjoy watching that value go down the fucking drain. Enjoy watching people who wanted to sign you now forget about you and start thinking about other players that they're playing against in the tournaments. And all of a sudden, not only does that value tank, once you get towards the end of the contract, you're not going to be worth as much anyway. Maybe then I do let you go. But you know what? We, you've, you've forced us both into a bad situation. We can both lose in that situation. It can benefit neither. So what do you think on that? Because it's not just your teams. It sounds like in your team, you've done a pretty good job sort of knowing where the line in the sand is. But I've heard way too many stories where the GM made, I like guess like they don't know their own job. They make it sound like I had to let him go because he said he didn't want to stay, you know. Well, I mean, look, there's times when, well, so in some of those GM's defense, what I will say is a lot of the time, their purview over the company will be a lot smaller than mine, for example. So for them, you know, their semi-immediate paycheck might depend on, like, not completely blowing everything up. Whereas right. I think, you know, I think you I can, and, times. I, and, I, <laughs> and I and I think uh, and I think people like Jason Lake, for example, you know, like he knows that he's not being judged over the next three months, um, but rather, you know, longer time period. So like, you have more more lenience in what you're going to do about it. The other thing is that like, you have to think about things from a bigger picture point of view. So, you know, if you, if you operate teams, even outside of Counter-Strike, it's very likely that if you're selling a Counter-Strike player to one of the other top organizations that you're, you know, before long, you'll be talking about player transfers with that same organization in another game, right? right? Like right. many of the, many of the organizations playing yes. the same sand, sandboxes. Um, and if you do that, you know, if you, if you, kind of give up your edge in one game, you've now given it up all, all across the board. So it also has implications for for other games. Like I think if you, you're soft touch basically. Yeah. So like, you know, you might you might lose the battle sometimes, even if you do the right thing, but ideally that's what lets you win the war. So it might be that sometimes you have to take a loss on something, but like it's a it, it's a bit like, you know, 
bluffing and just showing the bluff sometimes lets yes. you lets you play differently going forward. So I, you know, in those GM's defense, sometimes they don't necessarily have the approval or that they're just like their focus is just this rather than this. So they can't think about it the same way. Um, what was the other thing you mentioned? Basically, it's the idea that like the players trying to force their way out, and what they essentially do is they just hold you hostage. They say, you know, I just won't play properly. Or I don't care, or bench me, or whatever, you know. And that's not because, by the way, the thing about that is, I know to a fan, they're like that's their prerogative. It's like it's pretty fucking rude, though, isn't it? You did sign a ten-year period, and so I'm going to play this particular period of time. And also, we're talking enormous sums of money. They might want you to take a three hundred thousand dollar discount while still paying them to play in your t- until that point. Like some of this is like players eventually have got to realize this isn't fucking business and it isn't just like a bit rich daddy warbox just shelling out money for them to have fun playing CS. Yeah, no, it's 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 true. I mean, people people certainly view it differently. And like, by the way, like any basically any single player, like virtually every single Counter Strike player, I think there's maybe five exceptions, could at any time pretty easily find their way to whatever team they wanted if, and here's the big if, if they were willing to give on some of it. Um, but usually okay. it's it's both orgs that have to give on some of it. You know, both of them, one of them will have to pay a little bit more than they want to pay. The other org will have to accept a little bit less than they would want to accept. And, you know, there's usually other, other dealings in there where they're just like the PR impact, et cetera, or like, you know, the impact on your business, whatever the case that is. It's usually not the player um, who, who comes up and says like, hey, you know what, I'll, I'll take 50% salary for the first year. I'll give you the first 200 grand that I win in prize money. Um, I don't know if that has happened, but I suspect not. Uh, so like, like you said, it's, it's the players usually want to have their cake and eat it too. Um, yes. and like, you know, it's, it's player empowerment era, I think also in sports now. And I think in, in that respect, esports has actually been a little bit ahead of, um, uh, sports in the sense that I, I just think everywhere people care more about, you know, the couple of names, it's like a influencer world now, like people don't really care about watching bit or perfect though. They want to watch simple. Yes. People people don't care about watching Grimm. They want to watch a liege. Like that's the that's the world. Like I don't care who the players four through eight on the nets are. I'm turning the TV on tomorrow because I want to watch KD play. Uh, and I think you know it becomes more and more it becomes more and more like that. The upside is that the players, the couple of players, have more leverage to some extent. On the other hand, like there is a point in time where if you push that too much, um, how much is that player actually going to be worth to you? Like how, like how, how are you going to justify paying, let's say a million in buyouts to get somebody on your team who refuses to suit up for the, for their previous organization? Cause they just don't like the roster. Don't like something else that hasn't happened. Not necessarily anything wrong, just something that they would just prefer not to be a part of for whatever reason, competitive performance or otherwise. How, how do you assume that that's not going to happen to you someday you might have the good team now you might think they're going to put you over the top and like maybe that's worth the risk by itself it might be sometimes it is sometimes it's not but you are taking on the same on the same risk of that happening to you later on it's like that you know you talk to someone you ask them about their previous whatever experience and it, when it's all bad you can pretty safely assume that if your yes. thing ever ends it'll be the exact same thing yes at that yes. later later time Want to see more cool, funny, interesting clips based on topics from my content? Well, subscribe to this channel then, or, you know, be a pleb and don't.